ahi tuna with roasted garlic chips and hoisin hot sauce, banana peanut butter egg pancakes and maple syrup, <laughs> roasted one pot whole chicken dinner, yep. potatoes, peas, mm-hmm. carrots, and onions. You're making me hungry. I'm not trying to make you hungry. I'm trying to read out dishes. And Jan Arden's latest book, it's made up of journal entries and recipes. It's not a typical cookbook. It's called Feeding My Mother. It's an incredibly personal look inside Jan Arden's life as she cares for her mother, an elderly woman who lives with severe memory loss caused by Alzheimer's disease. Jan Arden is a much-loved Canadian singer-songwriter. You might know her from hit songs like Could I Be Your Girl, Insensitive, Counting Mercies. This week, she's releasing a brand new album called These Are the Days. And Jan Arden is here with me in Toronto to talk about her mom, her music, Indeed. and the upcoming Juno Awards in Vancouver. Is the applause for me? That's for all of us. Oh, okay. You have to make your own party when you're alone in a room. Well, I feel that way, too. I've been trying to get, you know, Mitch out there. I've been trying to get him to get a little applause button. Would that kill him? You know what I mean? Would not kill him. Too busy on There's the gotta in- be samples. He's on the internet. Too he's- busy on the Instagram. Oh, he's looking at the faces. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My my friend's mom calls it face claw. You, oh, you take gosh. a picture of her and she'll say, This better not end up on face claw. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's where it should end up. Yeah, really. And we got your dog here too. Yeah, Mitty's here. Thanks for letting her in. Well, I had to no sneak problem. her past security downstairs. I want to point out that Mitty is about the size of a peanut. Yeah. It's the smallest she's, she's dog. She's just I've over ever seen. five pounds. She's a malt, uh, like a Morky is is a Maltese and Yorkshire Terrier. But she's she's been uh, she's been in this building many times. She's not supposed to be in here. No, I don't care. But uh, they let Adrian Arsenal in here, so you know <laughs> why not Mitty? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I got a couple of answers. <laughs> <laughs> I got a couple of answers, but you know that's all right. Yeah. Do you, do you, why do you take the dog with you everywhere you go? Well, I mean, I I just I got this little dog kind of through default, and I travel 225 plus days a year. Yeah. And I just bring her with me. Yeah. Like usually I'm doing private shows, so I'm in my hotel room or I'm at a gig or I'm at somewhere where she's allowed. Yeah. Uh, but you know, obviously bringing her into the CBC building is frowned upon. <laughs> I don't know if it's illegal. Who? Well, just just uh, just the people. It's frowned upon by the people because there's don't... allergies and stuff like that. Oh, yes. I don't know. I would rather have her in here than a lot of CBC employees. Yeah, say CBC it. employees. I wasn't going to say it. You can say it. So yeah, she comes with me. I want to talk about some new music in a minute. I want to talk about the book first, though. It's called Feeding My Mother, mm-hmm. and these are recipes that you actually make for her. When did you realize you had to step in and start feeding your mother? <sighs> Gosh, it's got to be going back. So seven or seven, six, seven years at least. When she was 73, she started forgetting things. And you just chalk it up to garden variety stuff. Yeah. But then I saw my parents kind of struggling. Uh, when my dad was still alive, I'd be like, what are you having for dinner? Oh, we're having a can of soup and a, I'll make some toast. Oh, and then the next night, what are you having? Oh, I thought I'd open a can of soup and mm. have some toast. And then the next night, I thought I'd open, I mean, it was just like. I don't mean to laugh, but you know what I mean. No, it's I true. It's like, and yeah. I was just like, I said, oh, you guys have had soup quite a bit this week. And I just finally the bells went off. I started having them over once for once a week for dinner and have a lunch or something. It turned into seven days a week when I was home. Oh, my Lord. And then it was I started feeding, bringing them lunches. Like I would make a big pot of soup and bring that over to them. And But, yeah, my they were just, they couldn't, they started lying about stuff they couldn't remember. Mm. It's a weird disease. And when married couples have been together 50, 60 years, they work in tandem. So they work as a team. They, they, they formulate they, the lies. Well, at the they same just time. know. It, it's funny. They just know to protect each other and to keep outsiders, whether it's your own kids or grandkids or neighbors, friends. They there's so much shame involved with memory loss that the brain knows it can't show its weaknesses, so it tries to cover it up. Mm-hmm. So we watched that for quite a while. But yeah, and I just I had to learn to be a better cook. Right. Simple as that. Right. You were cooking for them there was every no day. Ma- I always enjoyed it, but cooking for me or, you know, cooking for me and my partner or whatever was never, that's fine. But, you know, cooking for other people that are, you're putting your their lives in your hands. Yeah. So <laughs> I just learned to, like, be a little better and got some cookbooks and watch TV and... But there's something nice about that. I mean, when I was, I know that this is obviously born out of a certain tragedy, the idea of, of, of memory loss and Alzheimer's, but... I mean, I'm, I'm here in Newfoundland, Ontario. I'm not in Newfoundland. I'd love to be able to sit down and have a bite to eat with my mom mm-hmm. every now and then. Oh, it was be, fun. We had a blast. There must be something nice about it. We'd that. always watch a movie, too. Mm-hmm. I, I have, like, a little movie room in my house, nothing fancy, but, you know, there's some lazy boy chairs downstairs and nice. th- throw a, a film in. And my, my parents love that because um, what happens with memory loss diseases is that they both lost their licenses, so they couldn't drive anywhere. So we'd stay out. I live in the country. So we just made it work out there and watch movies talked 
They walked home. They lived a hundred yards. I was going to say, how, me. how far away? Hundred yards from me. Okay. On my on my property, they built a granny cottage. Oh, nice. Uh, the house is still sitting there, but it's empty. There's nobody in it, so that's a little depressing. I understand that. Do you need a house? No, I'm okay. Because we can move it here. You know? Oh yeah. What would you, that if, cost? If, if you I bet you'd be your rail would take a house. You know, but the, the <laughs> National Post alone salary could take care of that. What Fed do you think? exit out here yeah. to you. Yeah. <laughs> Listen. Uh, what is that moment like, though, when you realize that the parent relationship has changed, like the parent-child relationship has changed? Because ideally, in mm-hmm. an ideal world, they they look after you. Mm-hmm. And then when you get to a certain age, you are equals. And then you're able to live as equals ideally forever. When was the moment where you realized that you kind of had – because it's, it's kind of a parental role for you, for them, mm-hmm. right? God, it's so gradual. It's so gradual. What's that – that adage about putting a frog in boiling water and he'll jump out, but put a frog in cold water and slowly heat it up and you'll kill the frog. Yeah, he'll stay there. I feel like the frog. Yeah. Because it is so gradual. It's heating up. Things are getting, things are changing and things are getting complicated and you just refuse to accept it. Yeah. Um, I really protected my mom for a long time, you know, especially after my dad passed away. I was just like, oh, she's just, you know, she's forgetful, but she's okay. But, I mean, my mother has full-blown Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. She's now in a memory care facility. Yeah, she went yeah. nine, ten days ago. So it's all very new for me. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, I've looked after her. I had full-time care at the house uh, the last two and a half years, three years. And when she started asking me where she lived, I knew that she didn't even know she was in her house. I'm like, oh, well, you and Dad built a house. Oh, I'd like to go back there sometime. Yeah. So we just, uh, my brother, my little brother and I just decided that we needed to, you know, do something and make some changes. So just, That's hard for you, isn't it? Oh, it's so awful. I can't imagine. I feel so guilty and... Right now. Yeah, yeah. Just, I feel ashamed somehow. I know that's a weird, I don't know what the word is. I don't know what other English word fits my grief. I feel ashamed that I can't look after her myself. I don't know what other word there is. We need more words in the English language. Maybe there's something clever in French. I was going to say, I bet in German. Because you know in German they, they spent like yeah. 4,000 words together and they make one word Well, I, yeah. the Inuit have 50 words for snow. We can get one word for the shame you feel when you have to put Please write. Can you send in? Can you tweet us? But it is. There is. Some, but you had to do it. Yeah, it I had has to, to do it. It has to be done. And she's great. Yeah. Her dog, I didn't count on. Her dog, Belle, is 11 years old. Um, she's a husky, blue heeler cross, and she's lived with my mom this whole time and lived in that house. So I left the house maybe, what, I've been here six nights now or something in Toronto. But the first few nights, she I couldn't get her off mom's stoop, you know, the stairs howling. Oh it was, I can't even describe. Yeah. I'm like, I didn't think about the effing dog. No. Yeah. So I took I think, her to the I vet. Think you're supposed to give them time to. The vet said two weeks. Yeah. So she's with a friend of mine. The dog is with a friend of mine. So that's that's going okay. Yeah. But you know, the howling, and then Mitty, my little tiny dog, she starts howling too, and I'm like, you are just adding to the cacophony <laughs> of confusion. The wailing. I know going it was on awful. House. Yeah, like banshees. Well, I had like a soprano and a baritone going there for a while. So it there's lots of changes, but such is life. I. I don't even want to sound whiny or complaining. I, I was very glad to keep mom at home as long as I did. I think the book was such a triumph for me because it resonated with so many people. I I really didn't expect to sell 50 copies of it. And uh, it was such a resounding success for me. And I talk to people more about that than I do music now. Yeah. I just spoke to a guy on the street that came up to me as I was coming in the building. And he says, I put my mom in a home the same day you did. Mm. And he goes, I've been reading everything. He said, it really helped me to move her and to know what to do. So that, that means a lot to me. I can't imagine what that's like. I remember like my father had to do that. After my father died, my, my, his mother went into a home. And it, there was a certain mercy in the idea that she didn't know her son had died. She, oh, yes. She didn't know, you know? But then, because the first time I saw her, she says, Where, where's Gordon? And I said, oh, well, he's he, he died. You know that. And she said, why the hell did I do that? You know, I just essentially reminded her of it. So there is... But you a, don't think about it. No. Where's the, what's the, what's the little pup it. doing there? I don't... I hear sounds, but I don't know where she is. He's barking or something. You get over here. Here, let me show everybody what you look like. Come here. Oh, what a sweetheart! Looks like my dad. Looks like my dad too. <laughs> so when I when now. I go to the salon, I say, "Give me a little of that." Yeah, right. Look at this tongue hanging out the side of his well, mouth. Well, she's got no teeth. Okay, that's st- enough of you. You're stealing my thunder. You that's all right. Zoom in on the dog, will you, if you don't mind? 
you go over here. Blur everyone else out. You stay right there. Um, you're a, this is this is different for you because when you were cooking for your parents every single day, you were also writing music. You're still you're still mm-hmm. an artist, you're still performing. Oh, I think writing music really saved me. I think when you are a creative person, I knew that I was dealing with low grade depression all the time, and I was dealing with an enormous amount of anxiety. But the thing that's important to note about that is I I had a reason why. So a lot of people that are depressed and having anxiety, when you can't identify the source of it, it's very frustrating. At least I had that. I knew why. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought I have to help myself because I'm getting really down. So I wrote a lot. I wrote it down. Did you notice the songs changing? Yeah. I mean, my mother kept sneaking in there. I was like, oh, there she is again. What do you mean? Into, Into my songs. Like where? A Long Goodbye is one of the songs on the record. She's in that. That song's completely about her. Mm -hmm. Leave the Light On is all about my mother. Um, Just references in my personal life. I I think even songs like Come Down the River with Me, my mother sneaks in songs like that. It's a a, a metaphorical song about a, a river being likened to a human being. You know, it's a lonely thing being a human. A human being it's isolating mm-hmm. but having said that there's a lot of strength in being a river you can drag a lot of people with you mm-hmm. and you can do it voluntarily or involuntarily you can you can drown entire towns you can take people down with you and I like that idea of it so I found my mother sneaking into that kind of that line of thinking where she's very tenacious she's very intrepid uh, my mom has never felt sorry for herself. It, mm-hmm. for, for a person with Alzheimer's, I think it's a relatively benign disease. Yeah, that's what I always like I, to think about. They don't know. No, they don't know how I think, sad it I is. think my mom had a two-week period where she really kind of was a little bit agitated because she knew she was forgetting a lot. Yeah. But then it goes away. But when that time passes, yeah. only you notice. It's only, only, it's only sad for you. the people around them. Yeah. Oh, we have a long goodbye. Can we play a little bit of a long goodbye? Sure. I've lost count of all the days I've been watching you forget. I felt tangled up and hopeless, but it hasn't killed me yet. I've been trying to remember all your memories, but I can't pretend that it's hard to be a mother to my mother, but it's like you always said. That it's hard to be a mother to my mother But it's like you always said That's Jan Arden with a little bit of a, a long goodbye. So you, you talked a little bit about how your mom changed. How, how have you changed, do you think? I think I'm a much better version of myself. Really? Why? Yeah, because I think it makes you very humble. I think you actually have to bow down to the idea of knowing everything and, and, and feeling like you can control things. You have to succumb to Alzheimer's because it's going to win every single time. Yeah. And I'm a very competitive person, and I'm not used to losing. Yeah. And I'm used to getting my way. I've been in a business that's very self-serving. It's very much about you all the time. Yeah. So I think it's been... Like I said, very humbling. My mother has taught me so much about patience and, you know, the virtue of tolerance and understanding and forgiveness. And what's her name? Uh, and my mom's name is Joan. Joan. Yeah, Joan. We've been saying Joan, my mother this entire yeah, time. Yeah, Joan Mary. We call her Joni. Mm-hmm. And uh, she still knows who I am. She knows who the dog is. Mm-hmm. Um, so, sorry, as you were saying, so you. you, you You've noticed some changes in yourself. Yeah, I, I just, I think I'm a better version of myself. I think I, along the way, became a much better daughter and just a much more, I've just let go of so many things and I really think I finally understand the idea of living in a moment. I think for, you know, years I've, I'm, in my job, you are not what you did, you are what you will do. Right. That yeah, is my yeah, job. Yeah. So I can never rest on anything. I can no more rest on good mother or insensitive or could I be your girl or any any successes that I've ever had, any award. I cannot rest on that because it's not how the arts work. It's only constantly pushing forward. And it, it can be exhausting because I forget who said it. If you're not appearing, you're disappearing. Mm-hmm. And as an artist, it's a frightening thought. 
and I've been doing this for a long time. I've been doing this. I've been writing music for 40 years, 40 plus years. And I've been with my record label with Universal for 26. I mean, I think this is my 14th or 15th record that I've made. Mm -hmm. So I'm, it's always, it's always going forward. But I think I actually understand that I'm happy where I am. I'm, I'm actually happy with what I have. I want what I have mm -hmm. instead of wanting what I don't have. So are you able to rest a little bit more yes. now? Yes. A little bit more, like not in your laurels, but be able no. to go, you know what, Jan, like <laughs> what you've done is pretty amazing. I And I love, I love my work and I love my job and I love the people that I'm working with, but I approach it in a very different way. I think I say no much more than I say yes. Right. And... I, I'm way, I'm just way better about being just where I am and enjoying my friends. And I mean, I've, I've never really been, I've kind of been the antichrist of the pop music anyways, because I don't really have much to do with it. No. I do a record every couple of years, but I'm not, I'm not in any kind of a scene. I live in rural Alberta. Yeah. But you bucked the system as you know, that's what you did, right? There was a system that everyone told us about how things were supposed to go. And how, I, I mean, I don't know. I think, I don't know if I bucked it. I just circumvented it. I didn't want to. Well, that's what it is. I mean, you, what you did was there was a, there was an idea of this is how you have a career in, in right. Canada. You okay. do this, and you went. I, you, not only like not only not only do I not have to do that. You don't. You don't really have to do that. No one really has to do. No, that. No, gosh, it's no. all nonsense. And especially now, uh, what's available to people, recording has changed profoundly. I mean, it really is affordable to anybody to make a record. Yeah. If you're a knucklehead that knows how to run Pro Tools on your MacBook. Mm -hmm. Or garage band for God's sakes, you can actually make some really great things. I got one of those Radio Shack tape recorders. There you go. Yeah, there you That's go. all I, you need. I sing into it every day. And never night. mind that. Then you can get it on iTunes, and you can have somebody in Ethiopia listening to your music. Let me ask you this: Are you going to be able to sing "Good Mother" on this tour when it yeah. comes to play? When when my mom was really sick, I, I sang it. I did some Christmas shows. I was on the road for like three months just before Christmas, and I sang it every night. And some I had to really think about not crying. But the thing about my mom, too, is I don't worry about crying anymore. I cry about my mom quite a bit, and I've never been a crier. I'm not much of a crier. I wouldn't think you were a crier. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And my mom said it was a very frustrating thing as a child. She said, you know, I would spank you because that's what you did back in the day. Now parents would be arrested for that, and you would not break like, what do you mean break? Well, you wouldn't cry. It was frustrating. Mm -hmm. You can only paddle a kid's butt for so long, and then you just start feeling terrible about it. But she said I was the kind of a kid, you, she'd hear a crash, and there'd be me and my brothers, and she'd race into a room, and there'd be a lamp and curtains hanging off the wall, and she'd be like, now who broke that my great best lamp? And she said you would just go, I did. She said it's very hard to be angry with somebody that just admitted to stuff. Yeah. I would just stick just my Just an mitt. honesty. You were like, yeah, it was me. What are you going to do? But naively, but I think I've always been that way. Just kind of naively. I, I think it was the path of least resistance. So, so go back. So you were able to sing Good Mother, and yep. you, you're okay with the fact that you might break down on stage? I don't. I haven't. Yeah, I'll, I, I can get a little bit upset, but usually I'll. the show must go on kind of an attitude, and I motor through it. I, it's very hard for me to look out into the audience because I can see 200 people crying. Yeah. Because it's upsetting for them. But I, I think they also are attaching their own memories and their own experiences to the song. And isn't that sort of beautiful for you? It's wonderful. I mean, isn't that what it's all about? Yeah. You're not going to hear me at a rave, but you're certainly going to hear me in a minivan. Or you're going to hear me in somebody's... I never encourage people to listen to me even with another person. I always do it alone. <laughs> do you think this new record is uh, surprising? I think it's the best record I've done in 20 years. Why? Because of Bob Rock. I'm I'm not used to co-writing, and but Bob only does grooves and chord work, like riffs. I was I was a little surprised. Like I don't really know how to tell you why I was surprised, but I was like, there was a moment where I went, "Wow." We thought we would try it. He said, "Do you want to just see if we can do a song?" And the first time we got together was in Maui. My road manager Chris Brunt and his parents own a place there, so we had a place to stay. And Bob lives on Maui, and it wasn't until, like, the 11th hour that Bob actually showed up. I thought, I've flown all the way out here, and he's not going to come. And he showed up at the condo and had a plastic bag full of chords, his MacBook, a couple of guitars and a keyboard and a speaker. And we wrote four songs that day, and we got together two other times, and we wrote another 10 or 11 songs. We wrote them very quickly. Like, when you write four or five songs in four hours, it is a... He would leave, and I'd be like, I don't even know what we just did. The very first song we wrote was A Long Goodbye. 
Mm. So it set the bar very high for me to where we were going to go, and we surprised each other a lot. But you also had to be very honest with him, very vulnerable. If, if, you, if you're telling me you're not someone who likes to cry in front of people, you're not someone who likes to get too emotional mm-hmm. in front of people, you had to access that place for yeah, Bob Rock. Yeah, and I, I, I think we've worked on, this is our fourth record that we've worked on together, the second original music record that we've worked on together. But I, we didn't know if it would work, but he was great. He has, I mean... Anyone that can spend two years in a room with Metallica yeah. has got to have it well, going I've seen, on. I've seen the DVD. Yeah, it's fantastic. He knows how to do it. People ask me about, what's Bob Rock like? Uh, yeah. I love Metallica. I'm looking forward to having you guys are coming on the show. Yeah. yeah. It, he's a, a wonderfully eccentric human being and super talented. But he works lightning fast, which I liked. Mm. So your, your father's gone now, too. Mm-hmm. It's a real CBC question. Eh? Yeah, he died in... So your uh, father's gone now, yeah, too. <laughs> he, died this, he died on my mother's birthday. And he had pneumonia. I mean, he had a litany of things. He almost lived to be 80 years old, but we're sitting in the comfort room. You know, they're giving him morphine every 45 minutes to try and make him shut his eyes for the final time. But, you know, pneumonia is not pleasant. And my mom was sitting there, and he was, like, heaving. And then he'd stop breathing for 10 seconds, and then he'd start again. And she looked at me, and she said, would it kill them to give him a lozenge? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and 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 then she when he passed away I said he's gone she says like dead I said oh yeah he's he's dead mom you, and she said well he ruined my birthday I said well we'll <laughs> we'll celebrate it later on but Alzheimer's takes the sentimentality away again, thank God she would have been yeah, crying again isn't that a beautiful thing it's awesome yeah it is uh, in the book I was quite taken aback by how you've had to kind of revisit who your father was to you. You talk about his struggles with alcoholism. You talk about, like, how does a father's death, how does the death of someone make you kind of revisit their lives as a whole, not as a series of parts? That's a, that's quite a question. I don't know. I'm still kind of dealing with my dad. We had a very contentious relationship, but I don't, you know, good things come out of bad things. I would never have been a songwriter had it not been for my dad's alcoholism. And uh, in abstractly, we need to, to steer clear of him. And my mom would say, don't bring kids home after school because I don't know how your dad's going to be. And we never did. Um, worst part of alcoholism is it makes people unpredictable. So we didn't know if we were going to have good, cheery, drunk dad or volatile, violent dad. Uh, so I just went in the basement, played records, guitars down there, the turntable, mm-hmm. all the Columbia House Record Club records, and I learned how to play songs. And I spent thousands of hours learning how to play songs Mm -hmm. and I don't I was an outdoorsy sporty kid Mm -hmm. and I would never have sequestered myself down there so that's what came out of that experience the reason I asked that particular question is in this book you had to take stock you had to take stock of not just your father as again a series of things series of stories Mm -hmm. but as a a man who existed Mm -hmm. that can't be easy you get to a certain age and you realize that your parents are people and they're infallible, and they have questions about death, and they have their own failures. You know, my dad was a construction guy. He worked in concrete his whole life, and I, th- I think he aspired. He wanted something more, but he, he did really well for himself. I mean, you know, when he died, he had almost a million dollars in the bank. Good for him. You know, I was able to use money to look after my my mom. It, it runs out quickly because full-time care is 20 grand a month. Mm-hmm. That's the minimum end of it. So you can imagine how quickly that money goes. Mm-hmm. And what happens if you don't have a million dollars in the bank? Right? You're screwed. Yeah. 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 The system here isn't, there's nowhere, I don't know what people do. Well, actually, I do know what they do because they've written me. They quit their jobs. They move from Nova Scotia to Edmonton to look after them and they, you know, or they move them into their house mm-hmm. and they give up everything. They have, they have a can of soup. It's terrible. Really, you know? Yeah, it's terrifying. And a lot of times people with memory diseases are left to their own devices way too long, much longer than they should be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, you know, what can you do? But my my dad was a hardworking guy. He taught me a lot. I'm a lot like him. Mm -hmm. I'm very stubborn. And he really taught me not to take any crap from anybody. Mm -hmm. I remember my mom bought me a pair of pants at the co-op for school. I was probably 12 years old. And I brought them home and they didn't fit right. And so I had to take them back. And, of course, it was an errand that she asked my dad, can you run Jan back to the co-op and take these pants with you? Well, I didn't have the bill or anything. So I carried – my dad waited in the car on the curb, and I ran in with the pants. And the lady basically said, no, I, you, I need the bill or I can't, I can't refund you. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. So I, my heart was already pounding because I knew he'd be mad. I came out with the pants, and he saw me, and his face just went blue. And he grabbed my arm, and he – kind of wrestled me into the car and he grabbed these pants and he marched into the place and he came out with the money. 
So that tells you something about my yeah, dad. Yeah. He, th- there's no way this woman was going to be able to say, sorry, sir, I need the bill. He probably threatened her with an, in- an inch of her life. Mm-hmm. And then we just drove home in complete silence. Those are the little snippets I remember of my dad. But I never, I never had a conversation with the man. Maybe near the last few years of his life, but he always yelled. You never had that full house, strings in the background Mm. conversation where, Dad, I just want to let you know everything you've ever meant to me. He told me he was proud of me, you know, quite a number of years ago. But he, I I thought my name was Jesus Christ and my little brother was God damn it. Right. Uh, I don't remember hearing my name. It was just yelling, Jesus Christ, don't use my good lumber. And like, how do you, when you're nine, how do you know what good lumber is from bad lumber? Well, you, but you write very fondly about him in the book. I, must I say. think fondly of him now because I know that he, you know, he was a guy that was afraid of dying. And he was, I, th- I think he was dogged by this religious ghost his whole life. He was raised a Mormon kid. And Where? Uh, Where? In, Lethbridge. In Lethbridge. In Lethbridge yeah. And my great grandfather was one of the guys that built the Cardston Temple. Like, I come from a long line of Mormon people and, uh, you know, ancestors that came up in covered wagons from Salt Lake City. Mm-hmm. I have nothing to do with the church, but when we were kids, Dad said, I resented being in that GD church, and I didn't want to go, and I was forced to go, and you kids are going to have to figure out what Jesus Christ is to you on your own. We never went back to church again, and I was never baptized or anything like that. It just it wasn't for him, but I think it dogged him. I think he was very afraid of God his whole life. I think he was had a lot of guilt about mm-hmm. But he was a good provider. Like my mom said, didn't matter how drunk he was or how how hung over, he just got in that car and went to work. I'm going to ask you a pretty heady question here. Okay. When you, I I was interested. Headier than what we've been doing? Yes. Somehow. So I have a drink of water. We're going into ideas now on CBC Radio. Hmm. Paul Kennedy's going to show up and we're going to get a PhD candidate to come in and run it down for us. Um, When I, the first time I heard of you was in Ordinary Day. Alan Doyle. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know about that till a few years ago. That You didn't that, know that was that you? Never. I mean, it wasn't, I knew I heard Insensitive was the first time I heard your music. Janie in Ordinary Day Janie singing in Busking Ordinary on Day the Street. is about you. and That uh, is mind-boggling to me. Let them say what they want, but she won't stop trying mm. is the line he uses about you as a child busking on the street yeah. on TV in Calgary. I was I was out in Vancouver. I, I but I, I he's told me about the article that he read about me getting punched out, but somebody knocked me out for four bucks in my case. Mm-hmm. I was out in Vancouver. I was 20. Yeah. And like really hit me good. Like I was out, but I had my guitar clenched in my hands, but they stole all the money out of my case. And you got right back up. Well, not that day. I, I, you went I, back. You went back and bust. I again. did. I did. And then I ended up on a fishing trawler. But Alan, I just knew about that story just a few years ago. And I was so taken aback by it. So that, that line, let them say what they want, but she won't stop trying. Mm-hmm. Does that come from your parents? Don't we all not stop trying? I mean, do you not stop trying? I mean, what, what, what are we faced with as human beings? I think some people, some people give up. But, you know, sometimes you have to give up. I, I, I'm not one of those people that tells people, never give up, never say die. I think there's a sensibility that comes with really trying di- things in a different way or trying a different path or trying a different job. I'm not one of those people that, like, give up your entire life and be in a state of misery your entire life. You want to be a sculptor, but nobody wants to buy your effing sculptors, sculp- sc- sculptures. <laughs> and you, you're like, there, there's, there's madness to that. I'm not that person at all. I think because I got somewhere and that I continue to get somewhere according to me, mm-hmm. that I have happiness in but it. But you were doing that when you were busking. You were not stopping trying when you were busking. But I, I wasn't trying to get anywhere. I think I was so naive. Like, I never thought an uh, overweight kid from... Uh, Springbank, Alberta, could aspire to go into music. It really is. People are always like, "What's your big break?" I'm like, "I never had one." What? It, it's thousands of seemingly insignificant events. When I look back at them now, I go, "There's a marker. There's a marker. There's a marker." But when you're in it, I I don't see it when I'm in it. I mean, I got lots of balls in the air right now, and I'm, I'm I'm not good at really any one of them. But I'm really enjoying the challenge of chucking them around. And I'm happy for the most part. I, I like this. I don't know when I'm going to give it up, mm-hmm. but at some point I will. But I'll do something else. I'm going to die on my feet. I bet. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. It's been, a, it's been heavy. I'm exhausted. Thanks for uh, coming in. Thank you. Really appreciate it.